Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 287th episode of Real Hawk Talk. I am Brian Nemhauser. You can find me at Hawk Blogger on Twitter. And I'm joined tonight by Mr. Evan Hill, who has become all of a sudden a regular on this show, which I am very happy about. Makes me uh makes me happy. And and Evan, just before this show, we were talking about hot dogs. Um, we're talking about hot dogs. I, tell tell everyone at home how you eat a hot dog. This is honestly like I Go use on. it so I, I didn't realize that this was like a controversial opinion. But I've always just eaten like plain hot dogs. Like when I go to Costco, I just order a hot dog and I don't add any condiments on top of it. Like mustard and ketchup are fine, but I don't think they're must haves. And I just genuinely enjoy the the taste of a plain hot dog. And you know, I lean into it to troll people a little bit because I've learned that it, it gets them going. But um, I genuinely do enjoy the taste of a plain hot dog. Like, would you would you eat a plain hot dog from Costco? I would 100% eat a plain hot dog. But the okay. whole time I'd be like, I need where's the ketchup? Like, I at least need the ketchup to complete the taste for me. Like, it's also a vehicle for ketchup, which <clears throat> I, I'm a big fan of ketchup. And you also are are not. It, it's fine. I think people are. I, th- I think people overrate ketchup. I think it's better on burgers. How do you say? What does it mean? People overrate ketchup. Do you think people are going around like ketchup is the fucking like bomb or like who overrates I, ketchup? I know several women in my life who like when we go out to like food or whatever, they're like they order burger and fries and they're like, oh, and I need ketchup on the side. And I'm like, is that normal? Is <laughs> For that- fries. Is it though? Oh my god, you're so weird, dude. I mean, I love this about you, but yes, like it's almost like you were raised in some sort of like bubble. Like you oh, were like I mean, I kind of was, your, but it, it, and you're like parents had you in a, like a basement. You were homeschooled, and like you've never were exposed to <laughs> normal social things like socialization. You know what the real truth is on this? Um, I was not homeschooled. That's a great insult. Um, <laughs> I was not actually homeschooled, but I'm half kidding on the insult part. Um, uh, I just, so a lot of people don't know this about me. I have a really bad peanut and nut allergy. This does yeah. not excuse the hot dog take, by the way. No, yeah. But uh, growing up, um, I had some light other allergies that showed up. And just growing up, my mom and dad basically just raised me to eat super safely. And they're kind of plain picky eaters as well. So I just leaned into it. So it's more conditioning, I think, than anything. There's things I've definitely like progressed on uh, food preference wise o- over time. But um, it's it's not really an excuse, but it I do enjoy it. Plain I hot mean, dog. you are who you are. And uh, I, I, I love you for it. And uh, I, I attribute you with being the person who opened my eyes up to the benefits of food takes on Twitter. And it came at a very dark time for me on on Twitter because Seahawks Twitter had devolved into Russell Wilson versus Pete Carroll uh, Holy Wars. And I just wasn't enjoying like like you basically just couldn't say anything without pissing somebody off. It was like not fun to be a Seahawks fan on Twitter anymore. And out of the like darkness rose this way to use Twitter that was completely asinine and had like no serious bone in its body. And anyone that got like genuinely upset would be like, so it's like so ridiculous. You just show them aside, but like you would post these food takes and it would just go like people would go off. (laughs) And I'm like, I love this. Like this is harmless and fun. And so I give you tons of credit for bringing that into my life, into the life of many others. You know what? You're so welcome that I was willing to share my dietary preferences with you. You're yes. so lucky. You're, you're just, you should be grateful actually. Yes. I, I, I am be. actually, I am actually <laughs> grateful. I, I, I appreciate it. And also just was like, okay, there's other ways to use this platform other than just putting Seahawks take it out there. Can, so, I, can I ask you what yeah. is your most, and I know this is a Seahawks podcast, but no, no, what, we'll is get, your we'll get most, there. what is your most like, I will get canceled for this food take. That oh. you like cannot share. I've got a lot of them actually. The one that almost universally gets people feeling very ill 
is, you know, have you, I don't even, I wouldn't say, you know, cause you have such weird food background, but do you know, like grilled cheese and tomato soup as like a pairing? Like, of course. You, okay. Of course. So you, okay. Got it. So there's other sandwich and soup pairings that I have and they're not nearly as standard. So, you know, top ramen, like ramen noodles. I love ramen. So chicken ramen noodles, like chicken soup, essentially with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And you put the noodle, you dip it in the, 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 sam- the, the soup and you put the noodles on top and you eat it. It is fucking money. I can't, I wish I could comment on this just because of the peanut butter aspect. Oh, that's but, right. You wouldn't even know. I mean, I like ramen. Yeah. And, and the times <laughs> I have had peanut butter, it's really good. So oh, wait, wait, we've got, I I've, I've found like, I found a like-minded individual. <laughs> One person. I love, I love it. I mean, <laughs> I, I've gone a lifetime and found very few people. Uh, it's much more like um, this. <laughs> um, okay. Give me, give me some, I feel, give me something crazier. <sighs> crazier. Um, Do you ever pour your milk before your cereal? pour my milk oh no i've started doing that why i've noticed that if i pour the cereal first i'll get super ambitious with the milk and i'll just like drown the cereal but so then it's you like have like post cereal milk to drink yes but it's 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 with the intention of me being uh uh in better control of my behavior in drinking mm. less milk i don't know why mm. i find it easier to like pre-ration it all right well i will i will try to come up with some other i'm like kind of surprised that pbj and ramen has not gotten people freaking out because like i tell you when i've told that to people before i've literally seen you ever see it in someone's reaction where they lose respect for you in real time like their opinion (laughs) of you changes every time i tweet (laughs) (laughs) i've had that uh in in that regard but um, i i will say this i love milk and this some for some reason grosses people out. Yeah. But I will drink like this is gonna gross people out. Okay. But like growing up, my parents was the most privileged thing ever. But in their in their second kitchen, they had a uh a refrigerator that was just full of two percent milk cartons. And they would stock them at like 14 at a time. So my mom would go to QSC and she'd get like 14, 2% milk cartons. And our entire family would go through those four, through those 14 milk cartons in like a week. Okay. A family of five. And I would just like reload 2% glasses of milk. I drink like four to five a day growing up. So we're not, we actually are the same that way. It is why we're probably as white as we are, but like, uh, I find a lot of people like freak out when I say that. I, I drank one to two gallons of milk a week. Um, okay. So I was like, I, that was all I drank. And now as I've gotten to a point where my metabolism isn't what it used to be. Mm-hmm. And I saw the calories associated with milk. I've become a, just a water guy. I just drink water. That's the only thing I drink all the time other than alcohol now and then. So yeah, I, d- I rarely buy milk anymore. I've noticed it. It'll make me fat. Honestly. Yeah, that's like, it. I love okay. milk, but I've had to give it up. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. We could talk about food all night. We've already like taken most of the podcast up on this and, and I'm surprised we haven't gotten more angry responses so far. But um you and I did the post game show. So I'm gonna spend a little bit less time. I do wanna like we'll touch on it if you have any like, you know, thoughts that have come up, but I wanna I wanna we're gonna do Patreon questions pretty quickly. So we'll bring those up in a bit. And for folks that haven't already, give the show a like, click subscribe on the channel, go to patreon.com slash hawkblogger, sign up, get access to the Slack channel right now where you can ask us questions. And we are a week away, a week away from a steak dinner at Daniel's Broiler for Ring of Honor members. We're going to have a lot of fun at that. So not too late to join if you want to do that. But before we do that, let's talk a little bit about the Rams. Um and I have a couple. I have a couple trivia questions for you, and for people listening to the show. Okay, and um, I'm going to ask these questions. I'm going to give a beat, and we'll see who gets closest on them. All right. So I don't want you looking anything up. 
All right. Don't look anything up. No, this I'm is, not. This is just, you know, can you remember? These questions are about the first game of the season mm. of this year, the Seahawks versus the Rams, a game that will live in infamy for at least you and I for a while. Um, first question, how many total yards did the Seattle Seahawks have in that game? Oh, God. Uh, I forget how many points they even scored. Was it like 17 or something? It's a good guess. Well, it was like seven, 17 score, points. Score, score was 30 to 13. 30 to 13. Okay. Um, I'm trying to remember if there were like... Was that the game that Jason Myers miss, missed a bunch of field goals? Um, because it could be like a deceptively high amount of yardage is like where my brain might be going. Uh, I'm okay. I'm just going to guess. Jason uh, Myers missed one field goal. 300 yards of offense. Okay. 300. Not a lot. Not a little. Uh, we got a couple of guesses in chat. We've got 200. We've got 112. That's very low. Um, the correct answer is 180 yards. <sighs> 180 yards. Now, that is so bad. I, I'm not done. We'll come back for a little <laughs> bit more there. Um, what do you think the lowest total is for the Rams in any other game this season? Like for a Rams opponent in any other game this season? 180 for the Seahawks. What's the lowest for any other opponent? I think it's a trick question. I think we were the lowest. Okay. What's the lowest, the next lowest, if you think that's the case? Uh, it's it's going to be something stupid high, isn't it? Uh, 280? That's a, good, that's a really good guess. Um, the answer is 300. Every other team has at least 300 yards of offense against this Rams defense. Um, I'm not going to go through all this, but I do want to ask a couple more. Um. How many passing yards do you think the Seahawks had in this game? So if they had 180 something yards of total yeah. offense, yeah. I, I I think I have a specific number in my brain. Is it 92? Holy shit, dude. That's very, very close. The answer is 95. I for some I remembered a 90 number in Gino's stat line. <laughs> dude, 95. They had 95 yards passing in this game. Mm -hmm. um, just as a like barometer, I haven't even looked this up. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Gino threw for 157 against Baltimore <laughs> when they scored. I mean, <laughs> so like 95 yards. That is wild to me. Okay. Um, one more, maybe two more. We'll see. Um, how many, how many receiving yards did Tutu Atwell have against the Seahawks in that game? 112. Jeez, dude, that's you're like pretty close on these. I'm impressed. I I, I remember the stat line on that. He it was, was 119. It? Fuck, but, are you serious? Yeah, but I mean that's very close <laughs> because I remember yeah. him and um him and uh. Uh, what's the other guy? Puka. Puka. They Puka. combined for like, they were like in a similar range. I think they were that game. They were. Yeah. Um, they combined have, like... those two receivers combined receiving yards for the Rams had more total offensive yards than the Seahawks did team wide. Yeah, each one of them had more receiving yards than the Seahawks had passing yards as a team. Mm. Okay, let me flip a trivia question to you. Okay, wait, wait. Before you do, because I want to hear it, but I, I just want to finish the 2-2 Atwell thing. So, 119 against us. What's the most he's had in any other game? Oh, God. Uh, I don't... Uh, 70? Yeah, another good guess. 77. Okay. Um, and other than that, he's never had a game over 50 yards. Like most of his games are like 24, 30 yards. Mm. Now, granted, you've got, you know, Cooper Cup coming back, all that kind of stuff. But that is the end of my trivia. I want you, you could, you could turn it back to me. But this was like, this was a outlier of outlier games in a lot of ways. Um, and it sucked. 
And we're going to think about that as we go into this week. So what was your question? How many sacks did Seattle have in week one? Oh, I thought it was zero. Damn, you do know your shit. It was zero. I, I mean, I'm trying to recreate, like, I, I, you've talked about that you will never give, forgive Pete Carroll for this game. Oh, and I, I, I want to I want to know why, because I... I my feelings about this game, Evan, was everything I was looking forward to and hopeful about mm-hmm. was dashed. Like the pass rush that I thought we were going to have was shit. Draymond Jones, the most expensive free agent we had signed, was shit. Uh, the the secondary, which I was excited about, was shit. I'm pretty sure Trey Brown had a bad game, and I was excited about him. The Kenneth Walker didn't do much. Kenneth Walker didn't do much. The offensive line was bad. Geno Smith wasn't that good. Like it was like on and on and on. And I was like, holy shit. And we have these two injuries to our offensive linemen. Our whole season got back. like I was so down after that game. Mm-hmm. So what why do you say that you would never forgive Pete Carroll for this game? <laughs> First of all, in terms of games that so the most frustrating. I want to be super clear about this in my, in the language I choose the most frustrating Seahawks football game I have ever watched. Frustrating, not craziest, worst outcome in terms of like gravity was the Dallas Cowboys playoff game in 2018. Oh yeah. I think it was that broke you. It broke me. It forever broke me. I, I go to therapy today because of, because of that game. (laughs) Okay. This, that game might be number two. Why? I have never seen a team show up with so much confidence exiting the off season and just get their shit absolutely kicked in week one with zero body appearance when it came to uh, like they gave a shit. The optics were horrible. They looked defeated. They looked lame. They looked unmotivated. It was horrific. I, I I I expected them to fight, and it didn't feel like they fought. I think they got shut out twenty three to zero in the in the second half. I want. That's to right. Say. That's right. That they was, were ahead at halftime. That was disgusting. It was disgusting from an optics perspective. Yes, everything went wrong, but the leaders I expected to be leaders motivating other players on the sideline were not doing it. The body language was miserable. I, I I don't know what else to say. It was it was horrible. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I just remember. <laughs> Love how you posted for like two seconds and then take it down. Oh, you know, we got to keep the keep it keep it moving. Um, I just remember Abe Lucas coming out of halftime with his helmet in his hand. And like, where, why is Aim Lucas playing? I'm like, what's going on? And on the first series, Charles Cross limps off. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh no, what is happening? And uh, we don't have to re legislate that whole game, but that was a brutal game. J- JSN was a non factor in that game. Like, it was just not Tyler Lockett had two catches for 10 yards. I mean, it was just bad, bad, bad. I think all the areas that we had uh, rightful optimism around uh, following the off season areas of investment, you know, areas where they poured draft resources into uh, salary cap dollars into, they just fell flat on their faces. And I think we left that game saying, Holy shit. Uh, is this the team? At least I did. Mm-hmm. I left that game being like, "Holy shit! Is this the team that I think it is? Like, do I yeah. need to do I need to completely recalibrate my expectations? Because I've been very optimistic. I was very optimistic about this team. Yeah, I think I, I had one of the highest win projections for this team in the off season. So for me, it was like a reality check, and it was a shock. Well, so so we'll come back to the Rams in a little bit, but like. Now, fast forward. The Seahawks team is six and three, meaning they've gone six and two since that game. How much have they recovered 
for you in terms of your expectations or your perspective about this team since that game ended? I think a lot. Um, I need to see them make it even with the Rams next this upcoming week. I need a little bit of revenge. I just I need to see that. I need to see some revenge from what they did to us in week one. This this team has dominated us. Sean McVay has dominated us. They've had worse teams and they've dominated us. Remember that one game like in 2020, 42 to 7 or something, where people were leaving in like the first quarter? Yeah, but that was a Super Bowl team. I I, I, I agree with you about the domination for the most part. I think saying that they've had worse teams is absolutely wrong. Other than this last, year. You don't think last year after all their injuries? We we slept we swept them. I know, uh, but we almost lost in LA. It was close. But we didn't. So you can't say they That's dominated right. us. When they've had worse teams, we beat them. What happened is they had significantly more talent than the Seahawks for a number of years. They have. But over the last 10 matchups, how many have they won? Oh, I don't know. Probably like six. I was going to guess like six or seven. I actually don't know the answer off the top of my head, but I think it's in that realm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that we, I think it's gone up and down really with the Seahawks since then, right? It, it was the, the Lions game was almost as equally surprisingly positive mm-hmm. as that opening game was surprisingly negative. The fact I mean, that they went and beat a good Lions team in Detroit after they had beat the the Chiefs home opener, they were like awful of piss and vinegar. We had no offensive tackles. We were playing Jake Curhan and Stone like all this, and we went and we beat them. That's that's their most impressive win all season. It I was huge, dude. Me. Yeah. Here's a controversial take. I think this win against the the Commanders is one of their top it's one of their top two victories let me have to go back and look at their so you're saying it would be lions and commanders because i i think um yeah well the browns is probably right up there but i think the commanders i think that was a good team playing well that they beat it's not a great team god i I wish they had beat the Bengals, man as far as I'm concerned, they beat the Bengals. Like it didn't, they didn't actually win on the scoreboard, but like they absolutely owned that Bengals team and like just couldn't get like basic things to happen largely because of injury. I, I don't feel like that's a game where I feel almost 100% confidence. If you made just one lineup change, if Jake Curhan was not playing, I think they win that game. I agree. So it's like, I don't lose a lot of sleep over that. I don't feel like the Seahawks are a shittier team because they lost that game. In fact, I look at that game and that gave me more confidence in this team because I thought that was the best defensive performance they've had in years. And yeah, sorry, go ahead. All right, so I just, it just raised my expectations. But let me ask you this, just switching gears a little bit. You and I talked about this past game against the Commanders uh, in the post-game show um, this weekend. Geno Smith had a game that was uh, had mixed signals, right? A tale of two halves. It had people feeling some kind of way. You, I think your exact words were, this was a bad game. And you and I kind of d- debated that. I'm curious, like with a few days distance, do you still feel that way? Um, Less so. And particularly because he limited the turnover count. Mm -hmm. That's something I've been harping on him for. I think he, over the last, is it three games? He has six touchdowns and six interceptions and, or maybe the last four games, something like that. But the turnovers are, are something that I don't think um, on his previous pace that this team is good enough to overcome. So for me, that was like, after processing it for a couple of days, the fact that he didn't turn the ball over probably made it less of a bad game and more of just like an okay game. And the fourth quarter performance is obviously what made it, which is what salvaged him. Um, but for most of that game, the whole offense was anemic. For the first half, that was true. Um, even then, though, they were on pace. They had 220 yards of offense in the first half. So they were on pace for 
I wrote it at halftime, 450 yards of offense. Sure. And they end up with like 489. Uh, but you got to finish drives. Like, agreed. That's red zone offense has to be better. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Um, before we get to patron questions, I mean, one of the other things that kind of stood out for me in that game on reflection, Evan, and I wrote about it in the morning after column um, on Monday. I think one of the biggest takeaways was uh, that Shane Waldron changed the way he was calling the game and the types of passes that they, they featured in that game were super different. We have been talking about it for years. Why can't the Seahawks have a screen game? Why can't the Seahawks have these run after catch yards after catch types of routes and types of part built in where it's easier throws for the quarterback. You don't have to have as long to block, um, you know, lower potential for turnover, all this kind of stuff. And we see Andy Reed, we see Sean McVay, we see Kyle Shanahan create these offenses that, you know, Mike McDaniel that are built around yards after catch. And I don't want to put you on the spot. Did you have any chance to see what I wrote in terms of um, uh, stats about the the dist the air yards for Gino? So I looked at it, and it turns out Gino's air yards per throw in the first half was like seven and a half, seven point eight. Like his pretty typical, like where he's his average throw is traveling traveling at like seven and a half yards. In the third quarter, it was like five. In the fourth quarter, it was like three point something. And his EPA mm -hmm. improved over the course of the game. Now, it wasn't literally linear like that, that it improved. Like his third quarter EPA was higher than his fourth quarter. But the point being is his production skyrocketed as his air yards decreased. That's not usually how it works. But for this particular game, we saw we saw kind of what we've been asking for. And I think we were also frustrated about it. So I think we lost that. But we saw a quick throwing yards after catch. Four different receivers had over 40 yards of yak. We saw um, slants to DK that he could run after the catch. We saw a lot of stuff we've been asking for. And I think, at least I can only speak for myself, I've been so frustrated about how the offense is just like not what I want it to be mm -hmm. that it was hard for me to really like give it credit. But if I look at it kind of objectively, I think it was a pretty big. That's the number one thing I'm looking for to see like, OK, is this a is this a like ongoing change? Can they hold that or, you know, was that just a, a matchup with the commanders and we won't see it again this week? Yeah, it, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how they they're able to combat Aaron Donald, Aaron Donald in this defensive line to see if that impacts things at all. Yeah, a hundred percent. So um, let's move on to patron questions, my friend. And again, if you haven't already, give the show a like, subscribe to the channel, go to patreoncom slash blogger and you too can ask us questions every week. First question, Evan, comes from Will. Might be a silly question, but I'm actually curious of the crew's thoughts. Is Zach Charbonnet the best running back on the roster, and should he be playing more? I love K-9's home run ability, but it seems like every time Charbonnet touches the ball, something good happens, and he consistently churns out positive yardage. That is insanely disrespectful to Kenny McIntosh. <laughs> Derek's not on the, the call, dude. You don't have to. I actually do want to see him play, though. Aren't you like sure. consciously optimistic that he could be a fruitful player for us? Yeah. I mean, for me, I for me, Kenny McIntosh is the not DJ Dallas answer. Dude, oh my God. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Yeah. We need a new punt returner. I got to say, I feel that way. The numbers don't back it up this year. He's he's like top 10 in punt and kick returns this year. Like he's actually been productive. Really? Yeah. I, I, I don't like it. I don't like it. It's like I, what, watching Jason Myers kick a field goal. I don't feel good anytime he's back there. It, you know what it reminds me of? Uh, is uh, What was his the white guy's name? Uh, Brian Walters? Was that it? Oh, my God. Yes. I... 
I'm, I mean, I know he fumbled like recently, like a couple of weeks ago, DJ Dallas mm-hmm. did, but mm-hmm. outside of that, I felt relatively confident in his ball security. Um, but it, it, it's just, I know for a fact, he's not capable of doing anything dangerous. No, he's really not. And that sucks we, though. We saw like... Godwin Igu- Iguibuike come last. Uh, I think you muted yourself unless I mess things up. Can you hear me? Yeah, it changed your audio to something else. To your uh oh, uh, let's see if I don't hear you now. Now I'm muted again. Anyways, I'm on the campaign for DJ Dallas potentially being removed. I'm just kidding. It just doesn't feel like he's ever a threat back there, and that's my biggest problem. I basically, Brian, want you can't. I don't know if you can hear me or not right now, but what I'm literally telling you is, I want I want to put you back there. I. I I want to see you be a dangerous punt returning threat. It's uh, it's just kind of lame. Technical difficulties on the Real Hawk Talk show. I think we have you back. I I heard you unmute for a second. Um, we should contact our producer that we totally have on staff. Um, now I'm trying to think about all the worst punt returners in Seahawks history. Actually, let's do this while Brian is doing this. Chat, can you please help me out? All the worst punt returners in Seahawks history. My favorite one, probably Percy Harvin, to be quite honest. Don't care that he punched somebody. Oh, Tyler Lockett. Tyler Lockett pre-injury. Oh, my gosh. I'm pretty sure I bought a jersey. Uh, I bought Tyler Lockett's jersey off. Maybe it was a kick return. I think it was like a Bears preseason game in uh, what was what year was that? Was that twenty third? Wait, no, they drafted Tyler Lockett in twenty fifteen. So it must have been twenty fifteen that I bought Tyler Lockett's jersey off a kick return for a touchdown. I think it was in like a Bears preseason game or something. Richard Sherman did do punt returns. Earl Thomas did too. I although I will say this. Uh, that scared the shit out of me whenever Earl or Richard did it just because their value is way too high or was way too high. Uh, Leon Washington. Oh yes. Duh. Uh, did BJ Daniels ever return one? I don't know. I just know the legend of BJ Daniels being like, he was cut and re-signed by the Seahawks like 47 times. And I wonder what he's doing nowadays. Lockett did return one against the Rams in 2015. Uh, what else, what else am I missing here? Earl Thomas on, it's got to, yeah. Earl Thomas on punt returns was one of Pete's most arrogant decisions. I hated it. All right. Nate Burleson. Can you hear me? Yeah. I mean, it's fine. You're a little, you're a little delayed, but I can hear you. Delayed? Oh, it's fixed now. It's good. Okay. Well, uh, apologies for the mic problem. I don't know. Something about my computer decided to stop we were, supporting my better mic. So you're going to have lower quality audio the rest we of We were life. litigating Seattle's history of punt returners. Yeah. And we you still know, are. Freddie there, Swain. Another, there was another option there for you, which is to answer the question that the guy asked about Zach Charbonnet. <laughs> Can you get back to the fucking question, dude? Uh. On a per carry basis, he may be most Seattle's most effective runner. Yeah, I think Kenneth Walker has much stronger like home run ability, and I don't think that's really a hot take at all. But like Zach Charbonnet will absolutely drag three guys and turn a two yard carry into like a nine yard carry. But if I want like a home run hit, explosive offense, you know, um, K nine's the way. Well. The only nuance I'll add there is I thought that was the case. And then when I looked at the numbers, Zach Charbonnet actually is a pretty explosive runner. If you're talking about, you know, 10 to 20 yards or 10 to 25 yards, he he is, he is producing as many or more explosive runs over that as Kenneth Walker. What he isn't going to do is have probably the 70 yarders, like the 30 plus yarders. And that's what Kenneth Walker does. And and that is incredibly valuable. But for me, I think there's no excuse for having Zach Charbonnet get less than 10 carries. I think it's the only upside of him getting more carries. And 
he gives you the explosiveness without the home runs, without almost ever getting negative yards. So I just, uh, it's less to me about like being negative about Kenneth Walker. It's more just, I, I think this team should be getting more out of Zach Charbonnet than they have been. Um, all right, so let's keep moving. Thank you for the question, Will. Next question comes from Brunden. Now that I, we, thanks to Jeff for joining in, successfully trashed DK into having a plus game, which offensive player should we shit on for this week or should we focus on the defense? Looking at you, Draymond Jones. Ooh, Brian, you should take this one. Um, who should we shit on? I mean, that's that's a fun <laughs> question. Well, how would um, Dana respond to this question? You know, how about Quandre Diggs? Ooh, do it. He's a fan favorite too. I mean, what has this guy done? for the Seahawks this year. Um, saying this without having looked up his numbers, does he have an interception yet this year? I don't think so. I kind of think he might, but I'm going to take a quick look. Um, Quandre, well, I'll tell Quandre. you this. Do you know what his... He has one interception. He has one. When was it? I don't know. Okay. Well, um, Giants game, they're saying. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. He is, he is, take a guess in terms of highest paid players on the Seattle Seahawks. Where does he rank this year for Seattle? Third? Second. Second. It goes to um, A, Quandre Diggs, and Jamal Adams. Where does he rank out of, there's been 35 players on the Seahawks that have played on defense this year? 35. Where does he rank as far as PFF grade? I'm gonna give you some. Can you, clues, give, me, like, can you give me a minimum twenty percent snap count and then re? re no, because uh, I'm gonna like I'm including guys like Tease Tabor who played okay. and Tyreek Smith. I'm giving you all of them. Okay, out of thirty-five, uh, maybe like fifteen. Fifteen. So he ranks twenty-fifth. Ooh. And Evan, I'm here to tell you, there are four guys on this list that are on the offense that show up because actually they're on they were on special teams because there is a fake punt, and they all had one snap of defense, and they all rank higher than Quandre Diggs, who has a below average, like 60 is your average starter. He has a 58 grade. So, look, Quandre's had some good luck picking off the Rams. That is a team that he's had some some good chances against in past years. It's time, man. It's time to turn it on. Uh, he is earning way too much money to be this mediocre. Yeah, he is. Uh, I think it's pr pretty clear when we talk about roster construction and Seahawks, we may have to say goodbye to next year. As we get towards the offseason, he's a pretty clear uh, number one guy that I think they're not going to pay $22 million to next year. So I, I think that's right. Um, okay, uh, next question from Faz. If you could add one Seahawks legend to the current roster and make them legitimate Super Bowl contenders, who would you choose? Is it Michael Bennett? No, dude. Of all the Seahawks legends, oh, Michael Bennett? I was thinking like the most recent, like from the past... No, it could be any Seahawk from history. It's got to be Walter Jones, right? Yeah. I mean, like... The only other guy I think that's in consideration is Cortez Kennedy. Sure. Um, you know, but... How about know, Aaron but... Curry? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Uh, Enoxum asks, we are passing on 60% of plays this year. Pete has always been a big proponent of run first. What can you glean from this new shift to a more pass-heavy offense? Is this due to the weakness on our O-line, a reliance on playing from behind, or could this be a greater shift in offensive scheme or something else? Is it – it's 60% across mm -hmm. all plays? That's what this person's saying. I Do you feel like that's – I may be confusing early down passing 
frequency. But do you feel like that's that much off compared to previous years? Um, I would say that, I mean, the way I would put it is um, the Seahawks rank 27th in the NFL in rush attempts. Um, but, but, okay. But that's just volume based. It is, but, you know, they rank 17th in the NFL in pass attempts. So, um, they're decidedly more geared towards passing this year. So I think that, I think the question still stands regardless. Um, and the question was, is that surprising? Something like that? Yeah. Do you, do you think that, do you think this is a shift? Do you think that this is like, like based off, you know, the offensive line for some reason, they're making some change or my hunch is if we go back in previous years, I don't think it's that off from what P has done historically. It might be like maybe five percentage points higher, but I bet, I bet it leans a 55, 45 passing run split historically. Yeah. I think that's still a pretty big shift. I, I, my read here is one, Pete Carroll mentioned this this week that he is unhappy with the split as it is and wants to see more balance. He's not looking for 50 50 or anything like that, but he is unhappy with the balance. Um, And I've been, I've been beating this drum because I think it was two weeks ago. I can't remember which game it was. I think I want to say the Browns, but maybe where they only had 13, 13 carries by their running backs and both of them are averaging over seven yards a carry. That is bizarre. And and it's just, that can't be the way that this team operates. They've got to take advantage of the run game. So um, I think that there is a little bit of a, of daylight between Pete Carroll and Shane Waldron on this. And I think that's primarily where it's coming from. The other thing that it may be coming from Geno Smith he may be checking to pass plays, um, you know, choosing pass over runs on RPOs. Who knows? So I think we'll see a little bit of a regression on this to the mean. Um, we'll, we'll see. I mean, with the with the talent you have at receiver, that you supposedly have at receiver as well, is it that shocking? Well, you got talent at running back too. And yeah. – I mean, I know where you're coming from, and I, I'm fine with them being a predominantly passing team. It's gotten out of whack, though, to me, where they'll go multiple series without like running the ball. They'll go, they'll go seven plays in a row, pass, 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 and they're not even necessarily that effective in the passing, and they're under pressure like 50% of the time. Like, There's a lot of reasons why the run game should be a bigger part of their plan. So it's more that for me than it is like, you know, significant issue with passing or anything like that. Um, But good question. Uh, Okay. Derek asks, which player on their rookie contract has the best probability of becoming a hall of famer? This could be a rookie contract. It doesn't have to be a rookie. I still think it's a fairly obvious answer. And I think it's Devin Witherspoon. Mm. Like, there's just, uh, I mean, he's he's probably front runner for D Roy. He's right there. He's neck and neck with Jalen Carter for sure. Yeah, I mean, the type of year he's having as a rookie in his first year in the NFL is absurd. Um, you know, we can't predict pace in future years, and we can't predict injuries. But uh, I would bet that if we go back historically. Um, the, the type of year he's having is is a Hall of Fame level type of player. So I've got a little trivia for the group, um, mm. you and listeners. You're just full of trivia questions. I always, you know, I, 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 I have a useless, useless knowledge I, I like to share. So the Seahawks are the only team in the NFL with four cornerbacks that have a coverage grade, a PFF coverage grade of 70 or higher. So they have four cornerbacks in the top, like 35 in the league. Who are the four? 
It's Trey Brown. It's Devin Witherspoon. Tariq Woolen. The fourth one is... Chat, help me out on this. I'm not going to look at the Seahawks roster. I don't know. Do you do, wait? You know the answer since it's a trivia question. Gosh dang it! Anybody? Uh, chat is silent. I've stumped the band. I think I can't tell if chat is like ten seconds behind us though. So, uh, <laughs> uh, Michael Jackson. Yes, that okay, is the yeah, correct that's, that's, answer. That's what somebody. I mean, I read it from right yes. away. Yes, it is Michael Jackson. So he has been silently getting like ten or eleven snaps in some of these games. Um, mm. And I, I was like, no way, it's already. Br- I didn't no, think it not, was already Burns. So. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, I I thought that was I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, I was pretty surprised that he didn't get traded and that nobody wanted to trade for him at the day, deadline. Um, Do we know that nobody wanted to trade for him, or that there just weren't that a trade didn't happen? It just seems like it would be so silly for the Seahaw for John Schneider not to take almost anything for him because he's he's not. He's not playing for them, and he has no real path to playing. So I I just have to assume that nobody really wanted him. I'm really of the position, though. Like, this is a position group I feel passionately about. You can never have, like, enough good corners. Like, if Devin Witherspoon, God forbid, goes down. Just, 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 let's not talk about it. But you know what I mean? Oh, like, yeah. Like that position group is so critical; it can totally end a season. If you, I got news for you though. Devin Witherspoon goes down, and Michael Jackson comes in. As we're still screwed, (laughs) so like I just want to be really clear. You don't, you know, when your best players go down, it doesn't matter. Um, Is Devin Witherspoon the best player on the Seattle Seahawks? I think yes. That's insane. Yeah. That's I insane. Think, yeah. I mean, for his, in, in reflection of his abilities, but is it also, what does that say about the Seahawks roster? I don't think it says that much negatively really? about the roster because I think he is, he has, not only defensive rookie of the year potential, I think he has all pro potential. I think he has in his future, he could be a defensive player of the year type of guy. Um, I think that's possible. So I think he's a rare talent. Um, But yeah, it would be nice to have, I, I think if you ask like how many other all pro level players are there on the roster? Like Bobby's playing at an all pro level for linebacker this year. He just is. People can argue, but he is. Um, I think that's it. Jason so, Myers. <laughs> oh, Michael Dixon. Michael Dixon for sure has is is on that. He's having a terrific year. Um, all right, let's ask a couple more questions, and we're going to turn our attention to this game and uh, previewing it. So. Uh, the 2000, Jason A asked the 2023 season is over and Pete decides to move on from Shane Waldron. Who do you hope we look at for our next OC? You take this one. You're always looking at, uh, coordinators across the league. There's one just let go in, uh, Buffalo today. It's, it's true. It's true. I, Ken Dorsey was fired from the bills. Um, this was a guy that I was pounding the table for, before they hired Shane Waldron, and he was in the running at that time for the the job. So the Seahawks have familiarity with him. I would absolutely hire him right now. Bring him in, not to be the OC, be an offensive quality control coach, be a you know assistant to the assistant or whatever. Um, he already going to get paid for his job in Buffalo, so you don't need like just have him on the staff. I think this guy's a smart smart coach. He's a creative coach. He's a quarterback, former quarterback. I think that's always good. Could help Gino. I don't know if I'd want him to be the next OC, but he's the guy that immediately comes to mind for me is, yeah, get him in the door and uh, let's see what he does. Um, All right. Let's see. I'm going to scan through here and try to pick. Quandre has some interesting tweets while we have uh, 
What's he been tweeting about? Just like cryptic wide receiver like tweets. <laughs> you either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Oh, maybe he's listening to our pod. I know a lot of people, surprising amount of faces that listen to our podcast. It is always a little disconcerting. I, I got it. It kind say. of is. It's yeah. like, I don't know if I want everything to be on the record, but here I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late, dude. It's Three, too late. Like, it's like six years too late. <laughs> you know, you know what it's like it's gonna wig you out is if if you ever choose to have kids, which you may or may not, but like like uh well whatever, that can be undone. So so like a hundred years from now, your your great greats could be like turning on YouTube and watching you do a crab dance. Uh <laughs> you know, uh like this is what we don't have that option for our like our ancestors, right? We can't go back, but this is this is capture forever. That is one of my favorite moments of being a Seahawks fan of all time. <laughs> it was awesome. And dude. and God forbid, God forbid the Seahawks beat the Niners on Thanksgiving. Oh, we just, are gonna go. It is gonna be we're gonna do a post game show from like a bar somewhere after. I will be arrested. It will be it would be I will be arrested. I can't even imagine how good that would feel. Um, I, I will be completely unhinged. I'm just letting you know that. <laughs> uh, that would be fun. That would be fun. Um, all right. One, uh, okay. Okay. This one's for you. Last well, Andre question. was talking about PFF grades on Twitter, by the way. So. Ah, so that's what I was just saying. Like, it <laughs> sure <laughs> sounds like, hey, Quandre. <laughs> Give us Just a ring, buddy. We'd be happy to have you come on and, and refute all this live. The the the, uh, the invitation is always open. Um, all right. Question for you from Zach Hassan. All things being equal, would you start Gino or Russ at this very moment? I think it's Gino. I still think it's Gino. And and it's a big like I'm a huge Russell Wilson guy, obviously. Um there were certain frustrations we had with Russell Wilson in Seattle that never made any significant progress. Seeing the middle of the field, um taking the layup, the check down, things that Gino has started to figure out. And well, the checked out part. He's he's never had a problem seeing the middle of the field. Um, it's nice to just be talking about somebody different, to be quite honest, from like a fan mm-hmm. emotional perspective. Yeah. So uh, maybe that's not a hundred percent rational, but like from us, from like a fan's perspective, I'm just an average fan. It's probably Gino, but it's closer than I thought it was going to be this year, especially after last year for both of them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the gap has closed and Interestingly, if you look at pretty much like any way that you evaluate quarterbacks and all those plot charts that are out there on the the Twitters nowadays, Russ and Gino are like the same quarterback from a lot of like from like a lot of ratings. Like they're just kind of in the same spot. And so there's I actually have had someone reach out and was like, you know, is there a chance that we're gonna regret that Russell trade? And I'm like, dude. Even though Gino's not playing well, he's playing roughly equivalent to Russ. And you get Devin Witherspoon and Charles Cross and everything else that came with that, plus the cap room, plus like solidarity in the clubhouse. Like there's a lot of stuff that changed. Let, let's be clear. Um, the Seahawks will not regret that trade when it's all said and done. But I do think. I don't think it's in the conversation for like, this is the worst trade of all time anymore. I think it is. I think how Russell is playing this year. If he finishes this year this way and continues to play at like a decent to moderate level, that's just a really tough bar to be like, this is the worst trade in NFL. Yeah. I think it's in the conversation. I think you're right. It it takes it out of that in, in terms of being like a real strong contender, but like, is it still bad for the Broncos? Yes. Evan, he still- hasn't even started earning his $245 million extension. 
exactly now. So like it's, he could easily like next year be back to being absolute shit or two years. Like I, I think it's actually more likely than not that he's going to be, you know, degrading as a player in the next few years. But you know who knows? We'll see. He certainly got fortunate last night uh, in that game. Bills. Oof. That's Feel a bad. that's a that's a terrible franchise. Ah, uh, makes me sad. Um, okay, let's thank you. First of all, thank you for the patron questions. Sorry, we didn't get to all of them. Always appreciate it. Patreon.com slash Hawkblogger. Sign up and you can ask us questions every week, which we will do our best to answer. And all the proceeds go to charity, folks. $260,000 plus has already been donated to charity. So join up or gift it to a friend. It's a great holiday presence and you can be part of the community and ask us questions. All right. Let's turn our attention, Evan, to this game. Seahawks are playing the Rams. Uh, it's looking like Matthew Stafford is going to play in this game. He absolutely tore us to shreds in the first game. He did not throw a touchdown pass, which is crazy, but he threw for like 330 yards, I want to say, 334. Mm -hmm. um, he... He had an 87.6 QBR, which 100 is the best, and like 60 is pretty good. So he just like made so many great throws. And what people may or may not remember is he killed us on third down. This is what started the third down thing, where the Seahawks would actually play good defense on the first two downs. It was third and four, third and five, third and seven sometimes. They were 11 for 17 on third down conversions, 11 for 17. That's a lot of third downs. 17 is a lot. So there's forcing them into, this wasn't an offense that was just moving down the field, but it was an offense that was kind of inevitable that they were going to be able to convert and keep drives alive. Um, you talked about Sean McVay, you talked about the trouble he's given them. They've got Cooper Cup back. They've got Puka Nakua. Kyron Williams, their starting running back, is out on IR. What's your what's your general expectation about how this game's going to play out? What are the things that you're looking at? Because you're going to be at this game, from what I remember, right? I am going to be at this game. I what am do, so glad I bought tickets early too. Yeah, what prices do you think? are kind of pricey, honestly. Really? Um, I wonder why. Maybe yeah. Seahawks fans going down during the winter, you know? Yeah. I don't know. Um, there's a couple of things I'm looking at. Uh, we talked about them, but we talked about it. Um, Seattle has to get to Stafford. <clears throat> there's like three things I'm looking at, uh, looking at keys for this game. And I'll just kind of rattle them off here. Um, pass rush. Seattle has to get to Stafford. They were very, wo they're woefully insufficient at pressuring him in week one. And he tore us apart. He was absolutely surgical. He killed us. Seattle had zero sacks on the Rams at week one. That cannot be status quo this time. Look at Boye Mafe to hopefully continue his streak. He's got, what, seven seven sacks, 10 QB hits, seven tackle for losses on the year. He's been an absolute stud. Seattle needs to generate a pass rush. So get to Stafford. That's key number one. It's very simple. Get to Stafford. Okay? So since then, by the way, since week one, Seattle's tied – for uh, almost four sacks per game. It's like fifth in the NFL. Slow down Puka. Slow down their receivers. Puka's the best rookie receiver, I think, in the NFL right now. He's like on pace for, um, it's something like 13, 1400 yards. He's having a very, very strong year. 10, you know, 12 yards per reception. He's, he's, a, he's a stud. He murdered us in week one. He had a hundred something. I think it was 118 or something you said in week one maybe 112, something like that. 119, yeah. Slow down those receivers, Cooper Cup, uh, Puka, Tutu. You, you've got you've to slow them down. So look for Seattle's corners to have a very key matchup with them. Seattle's corners need to continue to play like they've been playing all year long. Okay, so we need our, our, our secondary to show up. The second, the, the final one, the final key to this game for me is we have to give Geno time. So I pulled up some stats on this. 
His time to throw in week one was 2.67 seconds, which is on the low end. I think it's like bottom half of the NFL for week one. And in the second half of that game, it was infinitely lower. Keep in mind, once the tackles left the game, Charles Cross, Dave Lucas. So it was significantly lower in, in the second half since week one. So disregard week one, Seattle's at 2.96 time to throw, which is eighth, no, sixth best in the NFL. Okay. So we have to limit Aaron Donald's impact. We have to give Geno time. And this is the key. Limit the amount of turnovers. Geno needs to build off of what he did last week and limit the potential for turnovers. If Seattle gives the ball away two, three times in this game, they're not going to win. They're not going to win. They're not good enough to overcome it talent wise. I don't think. And the, the increased sensitivity of a divisional game and Sean McVay absolutely owning us. I just don't think they can overcome two to three turnovers. If Gino gets disrupted and you know, the pass rush, or, you know, LA's pass rush gets home to him. He will get psychologically, he'll literally be screaming out quotes like, Oh my God, that we saw in week <laughs> one. You know what I mean? And, and it, it, you, if we hear a quote from Gino in the first half of him being like swearing and Aaron Donald in his face, the game's over. The game's just over. We're not recovering from that. So my three keys are um, get to Stafford, pressure him, push him out of the pocket, rough him up, um, slow down their receivers. Seattle's corners need to show up. I think Devin Witherspoon needs to have a big game. Tariq Woolen, get a pick, dude. You know, cause a turnover. I know he recovered the fumble, but Witherspoon, you know, has, has been the the turnover generating machine. And then give Geno time. We have to have this offensive line uh, protect protect Geno. And Jason Peters did a great job at right tackle last week. Mm-hmm. 42 years old. Super stoked about his performance. Can he repeat it as a 42-year-old? Who knows? He was on a couch eight weeks ago. So those are my three keys. I love that. Um, should be noted Abe Lucas is expected back at practice this week. Would you um, take him? Would if he's if he's like ready to go? Would you? Would you maybe delay a week and no. just give Jason Peters the start? No, no. What I would do is I would play him and I would rotate. I would I would like like give him a shot to kind of get if he's really ready. I wouldn't rush him. I wouldn't like make feel like pressure to get him in there. But if he's looking like he's back and ready to go you better believe I am playing him because I don't want his first game back to be against the 49ers. Like I would much rather him get a few snaps in a game, even if it's 10 snaps and then rotate in. But most likely he's going to be back next week is my best guess. Um, But that's one piece. Uh, Devin Witherspoon did not play in that first game. So people may or may not remember that he had had a hamstring issue and he was not available in that game. Neither was Cooper cup. So that's, that's positive for them. Jamal Adams didn't play. I don't know that that's that big of a deal. Um, One other thing that people may not remember. And I think this player belongs in the conversation you and I were having about hall of fame or like great players. Boye Mafe. Mm. Boye Mafe was only playing in like running situations. Daryl Taylor was rotating in for like, he was in there a lot for pass rush and boy, Mafe was coming off the field. As crazy as that sounds at this point in the year, that's where the season started. And so now you've got boy, Mafe getting all those snaps, seven sacks in seven games. Uh, another piece of trivia for folks. I will not ask. I will just tell Boy, Mafia, there, there's a grade that PFF gives out for pass rushers when they're in a true pass set. And this is essentially like not just pass rush on any play, but pass rush in a clear pa- passing situation where everyone knows you're going to be passing. That means the offensive linemen know that they're going to be pass protecting and expecting pass rush. So you basically get your best view of like how are like the best pass rushers are the best. So like Miles Garrett, number one, Nick Bosa, number two, and P- Micah Parsons, number three, Aiden Hutchinson, Josh Allen, Max Crosby, TJ Watt, Trey Hendrickson, Joey Bosa, number 10, top 10, Boye Mafe. He is above Khalil Mack. He is above Zadarius Smith. He is above Hassan Reddick. He's above Daniel Hunter. He's above Cameron Jordan. He's above Kayvon Thibodeau. 
He's above Chase Young by quite a bit. So I don't think we can overstate how huge it is that the Seahawks in one season, really in two seasons now, but like have gone from having nothing to having a top 10 pass rusher, edge rusher, and a top 10 cornerback in the NFL. Dude, that's a big friggin' deal. It's not proven. They got to prove it over time. But like right now, that's a true statement, mm-hmm. which is pretty cool. You know, way Mafe's like year two step has been absurd. It's, I don't know if I've seen a bigger year two step in, for the Seahawks. Yeah, we. I know we've been talking about that draft class last year and how many of them have not taken the year two step. So it's uh, it's nice to have a bright spot in a big it one. Is. It is. So I agree with you on the pass rush. I, I think I'm a big believer that the run game is a big deal here. I mean, I'm not to beat a dead horse on it, but. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to remember if Zach Charbonnet played in that game. I think he did, but I don't think he played much. So, um, pull up, pull up. He did. He got three carries in that game. Mm. Um, so yeah, I would like to see the run game. Um, I would like to really see JSN was not a factor. I would like to see. Did he even have a reception in week one? He did. Okay. He had three catches, but like for nothing like 13 yards. So I would like to see this screen game continue as as crazy as it is to say that I would like to see these shorter passes continue. Um, So that's, that's my big piece. I feel like they've gotten away from the tight ends a little bit. Will Disley did get a couple of screens this last week, but you know, Noah Fant was having a really good start to the year and he's just disappeared. And I don't think that's on him. I think that they just have not been utilizing him. So um, last thing I'll say is related to what you said, Evan, the talk about the corners and shutting down the, the receivers. Mm-hmm. I know I'm probably just spacing on it, but it feels like it's been a while since a receiver has really abused the Seahawks secondary. Yeah, we uh, we limited uh, what's his face, Bengals. Oh, Chase. Yeah, Chase had one of his worst games. You we know, limited him. I feel like that kind of flew under the radar a little bit. Yeah, um, <clears throat> he had I think four catches and like fifteen targets or something. Like, it was like four catches and thirteen targets. That's something, like, or maybe five. Whatever. Well, I mean, the, what's his face? worked us in week one the Rams receiver yeah no both of them Atwell and Nakua both had 119 yards but I'm just saying since we've got since we've got Trey Brown and Devin Witherspoon in there I don't think there's been receivers really doing a lot for the last four or five weeks so I'm I'm optimistic about that even the the Baltimore game where everything was going wrong it was not that coverage was just shit. It was mostly running defense in that game. Um, mm-hmm. That that was uh, a problem. So, um, yeah, I am. They got to really, win this game, man. I'm interested in what's going to happen. So I think, depending on where you look, I think the Seahawks are maybe one point favorites, r- roughly a pick them. What is your prediction for this game, Evan? I think it's another tight one in the fourth quarter I think I think it's low scoring I think it's 20 I think it's 20 to 17 Seattle 20 to 17 Seattle Um, I'm looking at the Rams their right tackle might not play did you hear that yeah, I thought he was coming back for this game. Oh, did that did that come out today? Yeah, that's what I, I thought he was coming back, but I, I might be wrong. Um, because he's played well for them. Ernest Jones, their linebacker, did not play recently, and he's really good. And so he, I'm curious if he's going to be back or not. Um, I'm looking at this. The Rams. They gave up 30 to the 49ers, but then basically no more than 23 to anyone else. The Cowboys scored 43 against them, but basically they've been holding teams in the low 20s. 
Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go ahead and say I think the Seahawks are going to win this one 24 to 21. Uh, I do think it's going to be closer than we want. I think it's going to be tough. It always is. Stafford is expected to play. I see someone asking that. Yes, he is expected to play. So, yeah, I wish I could say that I think it's going to be a bigger. Let me ask you this, Evan. If they go down there and they blow him out, like neither one of us are predicting it, what would that mean from your perspective? It's a division-defining, trajectory-changing type of game. Really? It's that important to you? If they were to blow out the, the Rams? Sean McVay has dominated us. They own us. And he's owned Pete Carroll. Yeah. It would be really nice to see Seattle show up, punch them in the mouth, and just prove that they're the better better football team. It would It would drastically increase my hopes of uh, beating the Niners, frankly, hmm. and their chances of winning the NFC West. If they go in there and stomp the Rams, the sky's the limit. Like, if they're able to kick a divisional opponent like that in the teeth, that would it's, be exercising quite the demons. It is pretty rare. I'd actually have to go back. Like, there are not a lot of, other than against the Cardinals now and then, the Seahawks do not tend to like have going away victories against division opponents. Mm -hmm. um, nobody really does. Division opponents seem to always stay close, but I don't know, man. I, I, this one's really hard for me to see. I also haven't done my typical preview. I'm usually doing the pods Wednesday night after I've had a chance to write my tail of the tape. So I haven't like dug, dug in. Sure. But yeah, this one's a hard one to really see. I, I don't know for me if like, if they blow them out, if that really will prove a ton but I would certainly be happy to see it. It would just be nice to see. I think, let me put it this way. It is more important for me to see the offense look functional mm -hmm. and limit turnovers than it is for the defense to hold this team under 20 points or something like that. I would be gain more confidence if the offense put up 30 mm -hmm. than if the defense held the Rams under 20. So that, that tells me you're far more confident in the defense's Long term, it, it that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. Like I, I want. I would agree. See, I want to see the offense start to live up to their their talent. This offense, I mean, relative to our preseason expectations, has been a pretty significant. Oh, this like, is like a failure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, they have some advanced stats that are positive, but in general, this is like a top twelve offense, maybe like but it doesn't feel good. <laughs> it doesn't feel good relative to the talent and investment that they've no, made in it. No. So. All right, everybody. Well, thank you, Evan, at Evan Hill HB. You can find him there. All his hot dog related takes are available for if free. If you're if you're going to the game, eat before you go into SoFi Stadium. Mm. That place is so expensive, Brian. Yeah. Like I'm don't get me wrong, I'm willing to splurge, but when like a Coors Light is like $23. No way. I will take a picture. You take a picture. I want to see this. Did I I I have a picture of this on um on Twitter from last year. I'll I'll send it to you. I bought two and it was like 40 something dollars. Me and me and um Cashman? me and Josh. Yeah. No way. It's dude, it's absurd pricing in SoFi Stadium. It, it makes you like almost not want to go. It's crazy. Whoa. Well, it's, it's like bad. Try to sit next to that guy who made like the rap video while promote uh, proposing to his wife in the suite and Matthew Stafford's wife complained about it. Did you hear about this? No, I have no idea what you're talking about. He like they were like he had like I think I don't know if they were strippers, but he had dancers that were like in G strings, like, and there was like throwing money around and uh, take videotaping the whole thing. And Matthew Stafford's wife, like, uh, made some comments about it, and he started going back and forth with Matt Stafford about it. So you didn't okay. see this. Oh, I did not see it, and I pulled up my SoFi Stadium tweet. Uh, two cores lights, small ones. With a 10% tip, it was $43. That is nuts. Yeah, 10% tip. 
That is nuts. So pre-tip, it was 38, 19 each. I don't, I do not get like that has to be like gold encrusted. Dead ass serious. I literally remember this. I, wow. it, It was a traumatizing experience. Unreal. Well, Evan, have a wonderful trip. Hopefully you are good luck like you were last year when they, they beat him. Uh, and folks, give the show a like, subscribe to the channel, and go to patreon.com slash hawkblogger, sign up, get access to the Slack channel, come and party with the rest of the folks there. We will see you there. Until then, have a wonderful rest of your week and go Hawks.